This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is the 197th edition of the program. Today is Thursday, June 13th, and before we start the show, I want to take some time to thank all of our newest Patreon, PayPal, or YouTube members who either sign up for the first time to support us this last week or increase their monthly pledge. And that includes Aaron Washington, Adeline Ramos, Ahmad Harb, Anthony Tavernia, Brett Yeager, Frank Lambert, Jerry, Holly Lutsenko, Jazzy T. Marie, JC, Jeffrey Hyde, Jimmy Cotro, Jonathan Crisp, Jonathan Healy, Joseph Gorg Sr., Kyle Swenson, Mary J., Michael Marino, and Slapbox Digital. So thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you'd also like to support the show and join the independent progressive media revolution, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support or patreon.com forward slash humanist report, or as usual, you can click join beneath any one of our videos, and that helps support the show. It protects us against YouTube demonetization, and you just support the content if you uh, if you like it. So this week on the Humanist Report podcast, we'll talk about Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren's student loan debt cancellation plans, Tom Perez's decision to reject a 2020 debate on climate change, Dave Rubin's embarrassing take on the Crowder Maza situation, Elizabeth Warren's refusal to support Medicare for All, the Koch brothers' infiltration of the Democratic Party, a panel of Iowa voters that love Joe Biden and Donald Trump, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez's criticism of the Democratic Party's weaknesses when it comes to the issue of impeachment and Donald Trump, Howard Schultz's suspension of his campaign for the summer, Bernie Sanders' FDR-like speech on democratic socialism, and finally, we closed the week by talking to 2020 senatorial candidate Sema Hernandez of Texas. So that's what we've got on the agenda for today. Hopefully, you guys will enjoy the show. So about a month and a half ago, when I talked about how Elizabeth Warren revealed that she has a plan to essentially cancel about a half of all existing student loan debt, which exceeds $1.5 trillion overall, by the way, among 44 million Americans, my response was one, this is a fantastic proposal, and two, Bernie, you've got to get on this, you've got to do this yourself, because this is a plan that will definitely draw in younger voters. And those voters may potentially jump ship and go to war if they're supporting Bernie Sanders just because this is such a phenomenal plan. And guess what? Bernie Sanders heard our cries and he listened. Because as Jillian Berman of Market Watch reports, U.S. Senator Bernie Sanders is the latest Democratic presidential candidate to stake out a position on how to address college affordability and student debt, but he's not offering a lot of details yet. Our plan forgives massive amounts of student debt, Sanders of Vermont Independent told CNN's Dana Bash in an interview Sunday that touched on student debt cancellation. His statement was a response to Bash's question about how Sanders' plan on student debt stacks up against those of Senator Elizabeth Warren, a Massachusetts Democrat. Warren unveiled a plan in mid-April that would cancel up to $50,000 in student debt for most of the nation's 44 million borrowers. Sanders declined to offer more specifics on his plan for or student loan forgiveness during the CNN interview. When pressed by Bash, he said our plan will cancel a substantial amount of student debt and in some ways probably go further than Senator Warren's. He added later, I don't have the plan in my pocket right now. Warren had said in a previous CNN interview that her proposal to wipe out $640 billion in student debt is bigger than Sanders and goes further than his. So it looks like he's currently in the process of drawing up a plan, and he's saying, my plan is going to go further than Elizabeth Warren's, and Elizabeth Warren is saying, actually, no, my plan goes further than his. Now, I don't know that she's even seen his plan. So this is what I said back when I was talking about Elizabeth Warren's plan. Since she didn't opt to cancel all student loan debt 100%, 
She is essentially saying, let's cancel about half of it. She left Bernie Sanders' room to kind of jump in and, um, I guess you could say undercut her in a way and offer something that is better. And it seems like he's going to capitalize on that, even if she is saying, no, my plan goes further than his. But this is one of the benefits of having multiple progressives in the race. This spawns competition and policy innovation, and they're competing with each other to be more progressive. This is fantastic. Now, let me tell you why student loan debt cancellation is crucial to this conversation. Let's look at some stats here. So 69% of the class of 2018 took out student loans, and currently, student loan debt overall, as I alluded to earlier, totals $1.56 trillion. It affects 44.7 million Americans, and 11.5% of student loans are more than 90 days delinquent or in default. Now, the average monthly student loan payment is $393, and the median monthly student loan payment is $222. That is absolutely insane. Such a huge portion of your paycheck is going towards student loan debt that you may never pay off. Like a lot of people assume this debt and they expect to never be able to pay it off. They expect to have this when they are senior citizens or potentially until they die. I know a lot of people like that. I'm assuming that I will never be able to pay off my student loan debt unless a plan like this goes through. So it's absolutely crucial. Now, the question is, why do we have this need? And, you know, there's always a lot of people that like to shit on millennials and say, well, you know, millennials are just whiners. I went to school. I took out student loans. But guess what? I paid it off. Well, there's a reason why it's more difficult for millennials to pay off their student loan debt in comparison with boomers. Because when you compare the cost of college now with the cost of college in the 80s and 90s, the difference is it's infuriating. So when you look at private nonprofit four-year institution costs, tuition in 1987 cost $15,000. Now, when you look at tuition for 2017 to 2018, that more than doubled, $34,740. This is for a private institution. Now, when you look at public four-year institutions back in 1987 to 1988, that school year it cost $3,000. And going to 2017, 2018, it tripled. That is insane. So we can't keep going in this direction. With $1.5 trillion in debt, 44 million, more than 44 million Americans burdened with student loan debt, you've got to do something. And all of these mealy-mouthed plans that like capping the payment at 10% of your income, that's not enough. You have to cancel it so people feel as if they actually are going to be able to pay it off. Now, if you're asking me, I'm saying, let's just cancel all of it. Let's give everyone a fresh start and then make public colleges and universities tuition-free. So Bernie Sanders can potentially do that. It seems like his plan is still in the worst, but nonetheless, the fact that he's considering this is exactly what I wanted. So the fact that him and Warren are competing to be the most progressive is important. However, with that being said, um, Elizabeth Warren is gaining a lot in the polls, and I like that you know she keeps proposing these plans because she's really forcing Bernie Sanders to step up. Now, I don't know why Bernie isn't able to influence her to step up on Medicare for All. I'm not saying that that's the fault of him, but it's certainly her pivoting away from any talk about Medicare for All. But nonetheless, this competition is important. But as Elizabeth Warren goes up in the polls, the prospect of progressives potentially splitting the vote is starting to really worry me. Now, here's one poll that kind of gave me pause. So this is from the Des Moines Register. Biden is at 24%. And then when you look at Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, Bernie is at 16%. Warren is at 15%. Now, Buttigieg is at 14%, just behind Warren, and Harris is at 7%. Everyone else is pretty much polling between 0 and 2%. Now, assuming that if Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders weren't in the race and that support would go to the other candidate, when you combine them, they're at 31%. They would be surpassing Joe Biden already. So I'm getting a little bit worried that progressives could split the vote. And this was one of my fears going into 2020. There's so many candidates running. So long as there's more corporate Democrats 
to split the vote than there are progressives, then hopefully we can consolidate our vote and push a progressive to the front. But now it seems like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren are about even. Which, I mean, theoretically, it's nice to see, you know, progressives sitting at the top of a poll. But with that being said, I want to win, right? I want us to win. And this is assuming that, again, if, you know, Bernie was out or Warren was out, all of their supporters would go to the other progressive. You can't necessarily say that with certainty. But I mean, logically, you can deduce that they're cutting into each other's support. Now, remember, in order to get any pledged delegates, they're awarded proportionally, you have to get at least 15% of the vote in a primary in any given state. So what that means is that they're cutting into each other. And this really worries me because this could lead to a corporate Democrat winning. Maybe not necessarily Joe Biden because it seems like his numbers are starting to dip, but potentially someone like Pete Buttigieg or Kamala Harris. They're better than Biden, but they're absolutely inferior to Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. So at the end of the day, it's good that Bernie Sanders is proposing a student loan debt cancellation plan, and I'm glad that him and Warren are competing. With that being said, I really hope that They talk to each other about this and they stay in contact and realize that they both have the same goal to defeat Joe Biden and defeat a corporate Democrat and get a progressive at the top of the ticket. Now, I really hope that's Bernie Sanders, because if it's Elizabeth Warren, I do worry about her electability. Certainly, she's giving us a lot with policy. She's producing policy after policy. She's running a pretty good campaign, with the exception of Medicare for All. But I think that Bernie Sanders just has more anti-establishment appeal and he could really pick up voters that Donald Trump won over in the Rust Belt in 2016. So we'll see what happens. This is great. Love the innovation, love the competition. But I really, really hope that we don't end up splitting votes and paving the way for a corporate Democrat. 2020 presidential candidate Jay Inslee, who is the governor of Washington, He's basically running on climate change. That's his number one go-to issue. And he's not my number one choice, but I do find what he's doing admirable. He's trying to draw attention to climate change. And he originally floated this idea that we hold an entire debate on climate change itself. Now, I wasn't sure how to think about that at first, but the more I thought about it, the more that I loved it. Because we have an entire party, 50% of elected people in power who deny the reality of anthropogenic climate change. So if you got more than a dozen candidates running for president on the stage for more than an hour, I'm assuming, and they didn't debate whether or not climate change is happening, but they had a real debate on what to do about climate change, that really could be an educational experience for the American people, because you're not setting up this false debate between whether or not it exists or it doesn't. You're debating what the best plan of action should be. So I absolutely really like this idea. Although the DNC, who sanctions all of these debates, they responded and they said no. Now, I think a lot of people will probably question, all right, well, they said no, but why not just have the candidates subvert the DNC and have MSNBC or CNN host a climate change debate. Well, you see, the problem is that the DNC once again brought back this exclusivity clause, meaning that if you participate in a non-DNC sanctioned debate, you will be barred from participating in future debates. So if the DNC says no debates on climate change, there will be no debates on climate change if you want to get into future debates. Now, of course, since a lot of people, namely young people, care a lot about climate change, this wasn't a very popular decision. And Tom Perez was confronted by activists because he shot down this idea. So he defended himself. Here's what he had to say. As Christina Cabrera of Talking Points Memo reports, 
Democratic National Committee Chair Tom Perez told environmental activists that it would be impractical for the party to host a primary debate on climate change, according to a Sunday Tampa Bay Times report. On Saturday, the activists confronted Perez at a gala in Orlando, Florida, and asked him about the party denying 2020 Democratic candidate and Washington Governor Jay Inslee's request to hold a debate for the candidates to discuss solutions to global warming. Perez told them that once you have one single issue debate, then every debate leads to become a single issue debate in order to address the concerns. We will have issue areas in debates, including but not limited to climate. But it's just not practical for us to have one debate on democracy reform, one debate on voting, the chairman said. And as someone who worked for Barack Obama, the most remarkable thing about him was his tenacity to multitask. And a president must be able to multitask. Inslee, who's made climate change a cornerstone of his campaign, expressed disappointment on Wednesday when he announced the DNC's decision. The DNC is silencing the voices of Democratic activists. Many of our progressive partner organizations and nearly half of the Democratic presidential field who want to debate the existential crisis of our time, Inslee said, the climate crisis merits a full discussion of our plans, not a short exchange of talking points. Yeah, so I'm actually siding with Jay Inslee here. I think Tom Perez is wrong, and his reasoning is completely bogus. He's using the slippery slope argument, which is a logical fallacy. Because what he's saying is, well, look, if we allow for a debate on climate change, then we're going to have to allow for a debate on healthcare and a debate on democratic reform. And, you know, once you open up that door, then it just becomes a little bit too you know, a little bit too difficult to manage. So let's just keep it to multi-issue debates, and that's that. Except a slippery slope is a logical fallacy because it almost never comes to fruition. And in fact, since the DNC is sanctioning debates, you can say, all right, I'll, I'll allow it on climate change, and then no other debates will be a single-issue-oriented debate. Everything else will be, you know, various issues, but for climate change... We will allow for this one exception. But he's saying, no. And then he says, I worked for Obama and he was a fantastic multitasker. So if you're going to be the president, you have to be able to multitask. That doesn't even make sense. Like, what does that have to do with talking about climate change? Here's the thing about climate change. This issue is unlike every other issue. It's so incredibly important. It's literally an existential threat to humanity. It is more important than any other issue. The only other issue that you can argue is relatively equal in terms of importance is campaign finance reform because it's going to be difficult to get climate change legis legislation enacted if you have these fossil fuel industry shills and these oil and gas companies bankrolling politicians. But with that being said, climate change is such an important issue that it totally makes sense for you to allow an entire debate on this. If we put these candidates in front of a national audience and people get to hear them talk about solutions to climate change for two hours, can you imagine the impact that could have? It would be really educational. But Tom Perez is shooting it down and he just his reasoning is really bad. It's a slippery slope. Okay, but... You're the DNC chairman. You can stop that slope from being a slippery slope. Like, okay, <laughs> whatever. But you're not making much sense here, Tom. Imagine how awesome it would be to see each candidate present different plans as to how they're going to tackle climate change. That would be incredibly, incredibly constructive. And eventually somebody is going to win and go up against Donald Trump. What's that debate going to be? It's going to be about, oh, well, climate change is real versus climate change is not real. When that's not the range of the debate with regard to this issue, we need people to see that this is a very serious issue and here's a whole range of policies that we can address climate change with. But, you know, it's, it's just a missed opportunity, right? It's a missed opportunity. If you're looking about this in terms of the broader impact it could have on political discourse with regard to anthropogenic climate change and people acknowledging how important it is, then having presidential contenders debate it could do a lot. It could raise awareness about this issue, but, you know, um, Tom Perez is rejecting it, so I guess we don't get to uh, debate climate change. Now, will it show up 
at the Democratic Party debates? Yes, but will it be given the amount of time that is justifiable? Absolutely not, given the scale of this crisis. So I support having a debate exclusively on climate change, and I hope that Jay Inslee, as well as others, fight it. But, um, you know, it's disappointing because this could have been really informative, educational, and just overall constructive. So at this point, I've pretty much said everything that I feel like I wanted to say and needed to say about the Steven Crowder slash Carlos Maza YouTube situation. But now I want to talk about a different aspect of this story, and that is Dave Rubin, otherwise known as Rave Dubin, who did exactly what everyone expected him to do. He went on Steven Crowder's show to be the token gay guy to tell Steven Crowder that everything he's doing, everything he did to Carlos Maza, harassing him for two years, that's totally acceptable. And we knew that Dave Rubin was going to do this um, because that's what he does. He goes on Fox News, he goes on Tucker Carlson, for example, and he tells Tucker, look, I'm a gay married guy. It's perfectly acceptable if a business owner wants to discriminate against an LGBTQ couple because that's just freedom. I am gay and married. I do not believe that a baker or a florist or any business person ought to be forced to bake a cake for a gay wedding because if the government can force a company to do something for one set of ideals, they can do it for any. I'm for gay marriage. I even married a guy. I'm, I'm right. for legalizing marijuana. I'm pro-choice. I'm for reforming the prison system. And the list goes on and on. As for that specific line, I personally wouldn't want the government telling a private business what to do. Dum, 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 dum. So he's always the token and he's happy to be the token gay guy. But what he said was even surprising to me in this discussion that he had with Steven Crowder because his justification here and reasoning as to why Crowder should be able to say all of these homophobic slurs and jokes with no consequence, it's, it's honestly laughable. I was shocked at how profoundly dumb Dave Rubin's reasoning was and I expected him to say something incredibly unintelligent and quite frankly, just idiotic, but he even surprised me. It's worse than I thought. So here's a little bit of Dave Rubin explaining why it's perfectly acceptable for, for Steven Crowder to um, pretty much harass a gay person like Carlos Mazza. Look, you, I have no problem with gay jokes. I mean, the idea that you can't make fun of a certain group of people, um, it doesn't mean about destroying one particular person over their identity. But if, imagine if you say, okay, well, we can't make gay jokes anymore. Now, first off, gay people are equal in America. No one's coming for you because you're gay. So if there were rights that gay people Except did for other not, gay guys, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. But that's a joke. See what you did there? See? Incredible. See? Ah. Tell me where that's hateful. Yeah, go ahead. But the point is that you make those jokes actually because you know gay people are equal. So it, the point would be if gay people didn't have certain rights and then you were constantly going after gay people, personally, I would have more of an issue with that. I would defend you as a comedian and I would always defend your right to free speech, obviously. Sure. But the point is, if you're going to come after jokes, let, just watch where this goes. OK, guys, Vox, you want to take down Crowder for gay jokes? You got 20 years of gay jokes on Family Guy. Every freaking joke about Stewie, the baby, is about him being gay. And the, and, and every gay character that they've put in that show. And sure. The Simpsons have done it with Waylon Smithers. And you could do every sitcom, every Friends, every other joke. You'd, ha you'd have to get rid of RuPaul's Drag Race. So I'm not going to change my opinions and I'm not going to stop making gay jokes, black jokes, half Asian jokes, quarter black jokes, Canadian jokes. They're never going to stop. We need jokes. We need jokes. You know what happens to a society that can't joke? Violence. I mean, that's what happens. You start killing each other. Dave. <laughs> I hope that the paycheck you're getting from the Koch brothers learn Liberty and Prager you. I hope that it's big enough to where it's a nice distraction because I don't know how you sleep at night saying things that stupid. That last line there nearly broke my brain. Quote, we need jokes. You know what happens to a society that can't joke? Violence. Alrighty then. So if... Steven Crowder weren't allowed to tell his jokes, if you consider just calling a gay person a lispy queer, calling someone a slur a joke, he says that 
that could lead to violence. So we have to let Steven Crowder call Carlos Maza a lispy queer and make fun of his sexual orientation and him being effeminate and his mannerisms, because if not, then I mean, come on, we're creating a society where violence is inevitable. Well, here's an example of one of Steven Crowder's quote-unquote jokes. Of China. Yikes. But you see, guys, we have to let Steven Crowder do that and never criticize him let him do that without consequence, because if not, then society will devolve into um, a violent, authoritarian society. That's your argument, Dave? I mean, you could have made any argument. You could have made any argument, and that's your argument? Really? And see, here's the thing about hiding behind this facade of being a comedian. It's not comedy if the joke is someone's identity. And that's usually what these types of right-wing comics do. They'll just make fun of the fact that transgender people exist. Or in the case of Steven Crowder, he will do stereotypical Asian jokes that we saw back in like the 1930s cartoons. But he's doing that now. And, you know, it's okay though because he's a comedian. Now, are gay jokes permissible? Sure. If you're a comedian, then I think that you can shed light on things in a really unique way. But the thing about comedy is that if you're punching up, that's funny. But if you're punching down, if you're just being a dick to marginalized and vulnerable communities, that's not comedy. That's just you being a bully. But it's not even that Steven Crowder was just saying, hey guys, want to know a joke? Gay people. He was going out of his way to be hurtful. Where's the comedy in that? Where's the comedy in that? I don't get it. Now, some other things that um, Dave Rubin said that are just completely bizarre. He said, it's okay for Steven Crowder to do these brazenly homophobic jokes because gay people are equal in America. Nobody's coming for you because you're gay. You make those jokes actually because you know gay people are equal. He says this to Steven Crowder. Except... That's not actually true. And Dave Rubin lives in California, so it may feel like you're equal, Dave, but you wouldn't feel very equal if you were living in Alabama. To say that gay people are equal is absurd because gay people very much are not equal both legally and socially. LGBTQ employees can be fired in 26 states on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. In fact, in 30 states, LGBTQ Americans aren't fully protected from discrimination. And according to Gallup, 26% of Americans think that same-sex relationships should be illegal. Illegal altogether. They think you should ban homosexuality. And 36% thinks that same-sex marriages should be invalid. That's a huge portion of the population. And LGB youth, compared to their heterosexual peers, are three times as likely to contemplate suicide and five times as likely to attempt it. But according to Dave, it's okay because they're equal now. If gays weren't equal, then joking about them might be a little bit problematic. And he alludes to that viewpoint um, a little bit later. But let's just kind of dwell on this for a little bit. Gay people are equal, so it's okay to joke about them. I don't even know what to say about that. And again, I'm not saying that jokes about gay people are off limits. But context and intent are incredibly crucial here. It matters. If you're just making fun of gay people because you think that they act effeminate. If you're making fun of gay people or a particular gay person because you think he's a lispy queer. That isn't a joke. That's not comedy. You don't get to hide behind comedy to escape criticism. That's preposterous. But here's the thing, because gay people are apparently equal, according to Dave Rubin, who lives in California, then it's okay. But here's what he says here. Here's the caveat. 
if gay people didn't have certain rights and then you were constantly going after gay people, personally, I would have more of an issue with that. So that's more reasonable. Now, maybe Dave Rubin just doesn't know that gay people aren't equal yet. Because again, he lives in a state where legally gay people have full rights. Now, socially, there's still some issues in California. But what he's not realizing is that there are disparities in different states. If you live in Alabama, you're not going to be as equal as a gay American living in California or Oregon or Washington. He completely dismisses that and says gays are equal. But let me remind you that, he, again, he went on Tucker Carlson's show and said it's perfectly acceptable for a business owner to invoke a religious defense in order to discriminate against LGBTQ couples. So if you are a cake baker and you offer wedding cakes to heterosexual couples, according to Dave Rubin, it's perfectly reasonable to discriminate against an LGBTQ couple. You can deny service to a certain type of couple. I mean, do you not agree with the Civil Rights Act, Dave? I mean, this is, I can't believe that I have to make this argument to a gay person. He should know this, but I think he does know this. I think he's well aware that gay people are not fully equal. I think he's just playing dumb because he wants a paycheck, right? Now, again, getting to his point, if gay people didn't have certain rights, then he personally would have ish, would take issue with uh, Steven Crowder going after them. Okay, well, what's another group within the LGBTQ community that Steven Crowder often goes after? Trans people. He literally dresses up in drag and claims that he is parodying trans people by doing that. And they're absolutely not equal. He's making fun of them while they're still very unequal. I mean, think about this, Dave. Trump's transgender military ban just went into effect. 2018 was the worst year for violence against transgender women, and trans women of color were particularly vulnerable. Trump wants to allow doctors to be able to discriminate against patients on the basis of gender identity. Most trans people cannot afford life-saving medical procedures that they need because insurance companies don't often cover them. So they have to resort to GoFundMe and try to take out whatever savings they possibly can. And only 19 states offer protections for transgender people when it comes to healthcare. And Steven Crowder is relentless in going after trans people. So by Dave Rubin's own standard here, this should be a problem. He should be confronting Steven Crowder. But of course, he's not going to do that. Because Dave Rubin is a hack. If gay people didn't have certain rights and then you were constantly going after gay people, personally, I would have more of an issue with that. It would be awesome if you came on and played Spot the Tranny with, with not gay Jared. Sure, I'll play Spot the Tranny as long as they don't get called men. <laughs> what if they are men? This is why people don't take you seriously, Dave. This is why people joke about you. Because, you see... If you're going to grift, you have to make it believable. You have to make it seem as if you believe the bullshit that you're saying. Like, you need to make it seem like you genuinely believe the words that are coming out of your mouth. But you, we know that you're lying. We know that you're lying. We know that you are playing dumb because that's what behooves you to play dumb. If you start speaking truth to these right-wing hacks that you always talk to, then maybe, you know, Learn Liberty won't want to partner with the Rubin Report. Maybe you stop getting invited to go on these tours with Jordan Peterson, who is basically the Anita Bryant of our time when it comes to trans people. It's more about the money to Dave than anything. So whenever you hear him talk about this issue, you know, him being gay, so I'm going to give you permission to basically make fun of gay people on the basis of their identity... No, you don't get to do that. You don't get to speak on behalf of gay people, and you don't speak on behalf of gay people. You've sold out, so nothing you say is legitimate to anyone, and you absolutely do not represent the LGBTQ community. And it's a shame. You're essentially allowing these right-wing goons like Steven Crowder to be openly homophobic, and you're giving them permission to be homophobic, even if you know that it's detrimental to the mental health of LGBTQ youth, even if you know that he often makes fun of trans people in a way that makes them hate themselves and hate who they are. Shame on you, Dave, because you are a disgusting, pathetic hack, and you are the 
quintessential sellout. You are the example people should go to when trying to see what a sellout looks like in modern American politics. I hope you can sleep at night. So Elizabeth Warren, I've been pretty pleasantly surprised by the way she's running her campaign because it's very evident that she's going out of her way to run a very issue-oriented campaign. And her slogan is, I've got a plan for that. So what that tells me is that she's trying to demonstrate to voters that she is attentive to their policy-specific concerns. If you run a campaign based on policy, then I think that's really going to help you out. And it shows because she is rising in the polls. And according to her Iowa comms director, she also has a sign for everything. She's putting her policies front and center so that way people can choose what policy that they care about if they support Elizabeth Warren. However, as Emma Viglin points out, there's no sign here for Medicare for All. And Emma states, Warren is actively pivoting away from campaigning on healthcare, and it's really obvious. It's a massive blotch on an otherwise perfectly run campaign, in my view. And to be clear, it's not just that, oh, well, she doesn't have a Medicare for All sign, so she must be pivoting away from Medicare for All. No, this issue goes deeper, actually. Elizabeth Warren has been very conspicuously moving away from Medicare for All. Her slogan is, I've got a plan for that, but it's almost like she goes out of her way to avoid talking about Medicare for All. And when she touches on healthcare, it's very vague. There's never any policy specifics. And to give you an example of that, when she did her scene in town hall, she was asked about her support for Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All bill. And watch how quickly she ran away from that. You are a co-sponsor of Senator Bernie yep. Sanders' Medicare for, for All bill. And I understand there are a lot of different paths to universal coverage. But, yep. but his bill that you've co-sponsored would essentially eliminate private insurance. Is that something you could support? He's got to run away for that. I think we get everybody together. And that's what it is. We'll decide. Um, I've also co-sponsored other bills, including expanding Medicaid is another approach that we use. But what's really important to me about this is we never lose sight of what the center is. Because the center is about making sure that every single person in this country gets the coverage they need and that it's at a price that they can afford. We start with our values, we'll get to the right place. So make no mistake about it, what you saw there was Elizabeth Warren running away from her support of Medicare for All. Well, you supported Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All bill. Yeah, but I also support these other ideas. Now that's incredibly startling to me because when you go back to 2017 when she co-sponsored Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All bill and she spoke out about Medicare for All and she gave this really passionate defense, you know, it assured me that even if she has some flaws as a politician, even if she let us down from time to time, she still has the right ideas and she's fighting for what we all want, which is Medicare for All. However, for whatever reason, since she launched her campaign, she's just going out of her way to avoid even mentioning Medicare for All. And when you go to her website, there's not even a healthcare section available. And for someone who has a plan for everything, I just don't get this. Why would you do something like this and not expect us to notice? Now, this isn't me trying to release an attack video on Elizabeth Warren. This is me saying, what gives? What's happening? And I'm not the only one who has noticed this. Because when you go to Jacobin writer Tim Higginbotham, he talks about how she really has gone out of her way to avoid this issue. And he writes about how at town halls, she really refuses to touch this issue. He states, Warren had several opportunities in the town hall to address the healthcare crisis. Instead, she avoided the topic almost entirely, even when discussing issues directly related to healthcare, like repealing the Hyde Amendment and improving access to hearing aids. She neglected to propose a comprehensive policy solution. Unfortunately, this was not a simple case of forgetfulness. In fact, it continues a disturbing trend with the Warren campaign. Check her website. In a long and thorough issues page full of bold plans to eliminate 
alleviate American suffering, Warren makes no mention of healthcare. View her campaign materials. Warren has yard signs dedicated to several of her major policy proposals, but not a single one about healthcare. Follow her campaign appearances. You'll hear the usual platitudes. Healthcare is a human right. Everyone deserves access to care. But you won't hear her endorse a specific policy. Warren's avoidance of the issue is shocking. Healthcare repeatedly polls as the most important issue for voters. 80% told Gallup recently it's extremely or very important to their vote. This is no surprise as nearly 30 million Americans lack health insurance and those who have it face prohibitive out-of-pocket costs and the ever-present fear that their employer will throw them off their plan. The system is a colossal mess and Americans are desperate for a solution. It's fair to ask why Warren, who supports bold progressive policies on a number of major issues, is avoiding the most important issue to voters. It could be a reluctance to attach herself to a rival candidate's signature policy, or it could be a way to avoid conflict with the powerful healthcare corporations in her home state of Massachusetts. Either way, it meshes well with a years-long effort by Democrats to blur the meaning of Medicare for All by gesturing goodwill towards single-payer advocates while attempting to redefine the phrase and apply it to public option proposals that preserve the private insurance industry. By following this playbook, Warren is actively supporting the corporate effort to kill the growing Medicare for All movement. Warren supporters shouldn't tolerate this. And I co-sign that 100%. If you support Elizabeth Warren... I get it. It's like week after week, she comes out with a really bold, innovative policy idea. I mean, she was the first in this race, I believe, to propose student loan debt cancellation. Now, she's not canceling 100% of student loan debt like other candidates, like Wayne Massam. But I mean, nonetheless, for a major candidate to propose this, it's, it's phenomenal. But with that being said, it's odd. If you've got a plan for everything, if you've been bold on everything else, but you're backing away in a very conspicuous way when it comes to a really important issue like Medicare for All, I can't help but wonder, what gives? What gives? Why are you pivoting? Because we all see it. We all realize it. So I wish that somebody would ask her about this in mainstream media. I've invited her on the program, and I heard back from her campaign, and then they started ghosting me. So then that she's not coming on the Humanist Report, but for a journalist in mainstream media, or even in indie media, if she goes on TYT again, please ask Elizabeth Warren why she's very clearly distancing herself from Medicare for All after previously supporting it. Why is she doing this? If you've got a plan for everything, then you can't go out of your way to avoid talking about something that people are concerned about. You can't tell us that healthcare is a human right if you don't support the policy that makes it a human right by guaranteeing it, by making it free at the point of service. Now, saying that healthcare is a human right, let's just face it, it no longer has any meaning because every corporate Democrat, including John Delaney, who's going out of his way to attack Medicare for all, will frequently say, Healthcare is a human right, and I support universal healthcare. But these words are meaningless if they don't support Medicare for all explicitly and support this idea that healthcare should be free at the point of service, meaning if you don't have any money, you could still see a doctor. They don't believe that healthcare is a human right because something that's a human right. That shouldn't be an exclusionary thing. Like if you truly believe healthcare is a human right, then a homeless person on the streets who doesn't have a dollar to his or her name should be able to get access to said right. So I really, really hope that Elizabeth Warren reverses course because she's gaining in the polls. So as you become a prominent contender in this 2020 field and purport to represent the progressive community, you can't leave out Medicare for all. This is one of our most important issues. So to leave this out, it's just incredibly puzzling to me and infuriating. So for the love of God, if anybody is able to ask Elizabeth Warren a question, ask her why she is pivoting away from Medicare for All after previously supporting it, because this is a troubling sign of what's to come. If she's elected president, what else is she going to pivot away from? If she's going to pivot away from something as important as Medicare for All, what else is she going to pivot away from? We should expect and demand better from politicians who claim to be progressive. And Elizabeth Warren is no exception. I also criticize Bernie Sanders where it's warranted. So I'm not going to withhold criticism when it comes to Elizabeth Warren. If you're going to claim to be progressive, then 
You've got to walk the walk. And the fact that you refuse to talk about Medicare for All is incredibly troubling. So she's got to give us an explanation. Because when you're running a great campaign and you've got a policy for pretty much everything, to exclude healthcare doesn't make any sense. And she's got to explain herself here. I need everyone to understand that if a politician talks about campaign finance reform, but they add the caveat that we need to get dark money out of politics, then you've got to understand that they're not taking this issue seriously. We need to get all money out of politics because money and allowing capital into democracy, this destroys democracy. What we're witnessing currently is capitalism eating away at our democracy. And when democracy is at stake, when capitalism has hollowed out our democratic institutions, it's time we take action. And if we don't, it's going to get worse. And hey, here's an example of it getting a lot worse, because guess what? The Koch brothers, notorious right-wing billionaires, they just came out and admitted that they're not just going to be buying off politicians who are Republicans. They're now opening the doors to bankrolling independents and Democrats. So as Brian Schwartz of CNBC reports, the political arm of the network funded in part by libertarian billionaire Charles Koch is turning over a new leaf for the upcoming elections and expanding its engagement to include supporting Democrats running for office. In a memo distributed to employees and activists, Emily Seidel, CEO of the Koch-affiliated Americans for Prosperity, said the organization is going into the next round of congressional elections being open to backing Democrats in primary fights as long as they support some of the network's proposed policies. AFP or AFP Action, the group's super PAC, will be ready to engage in contested U.S. Senate, U.S. House, and state-level primary races, including Republican, Democrat, Independent, or otherwise, to support sitting legislators who lead by uniting with others to pass principled policy and get good things done, Seidel said. Historically, the political network has only backed Republicans running for Congress. So, imagine the effect that this would have because they're going after primary fights, right? They're targeting vulnerable Democrats in primary fights. Now, if you're on the progressive left, you are actively trying to help people like Shahid Batar, Michaela Wilkes, Cori Bush, all primary and corporate Democrats. But in the event, the Koch brothers stepped in and started donating to corporate Democrats, can you imagine how detrimental that would be to the cause of brand new Congress or Justice Democrats? Grassroots candidates would be incapable of competing with right-wing Coke money. It's already difficult to compete with these corporate Democrats who outspend progressives, oftentimes 10 to 1. But if the Koch brothers stepped in, we would have virtually no chance at primarying corporate Democrats. It's already tough. But upsets like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez would become almost impossible if this were to happen. So in response to this, we need Democratic Party leadership to scream at the top of their lungs. We need Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer to denounce this and say any Democrat who accepts money from the Koch brothers network and Americans for Prosperity, they're cut off. You're not getting money from the DNC or the DCCC, because that is a bridge too far. We already let you guys do what you want. We already are letting you all slide to the right. But if you take money from the Koch brothers, that delegitimizes the aggregate party and we just can't accept it. So that's what we need Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer to do, because this is really an existential threat to democracy. Because think about this. If Koch brothers start bankrolling corporate Democrats too, Every election will be a victory for them. They win every single election because they have their cronies in office. And if you don't think that money from the Koch brothers is corrosive, look at what it did to Dave Rubin. He worked for the Young Turks. He got his career start on the Young Turks, was seemingly progressive, and then all of a sudden, 
His show teams up with Learn Liberty, which receives a large portion of funding from the Koch brothers, and all of a sudden, he's espousing these same tired right-wing talking points as all the other right-wing hacks are doing. So you saw what it did to Dave Rubin. Imagine it having that effect on lawmakers in Congress. They're already corrupt, but imagine if Steny Hoyer started taking Koch brother money. He would be indistinguishable from a Republican. Not just moderate Republicans like Susan Collins, but the average Republican, which is a far-right extremist. So this is something that absolutely should not be tolerated. And I really hope that Democratic Party leadership think of the optics and how this will hurt their image among the Democratic Party base. But will they do that? I doubt it. I doubt they'd condemn this because they are in that leadership position specifically because they are prolific fundraisers. So why would they do anything to jeopardize their fundraising? Look, here's the thing. Be very vigilant. If a Democratic Party lawmaker takes money from a Coke-affiliated network, that person is not your friend. Just because they have a D next to their, to their name doesn't make them your friend. They are your enemy and they are actively fighting against the things that you want implemented. So I'm always fascinated in these voter panels that CNN does because I think it really does give you some good insight into what some voters are thinking. Now, it's just anecdotal evidence. It may not necessarily be as useful as aggregate polling data, but nonetheless, I do find these fascinating. Although this one here that I have up on the screen, it's a poll of Iowa voters, some of which support Joe Biden, some of which support Donald Trump. And... I wanted to talk about this, but I can't just do a traditional segment because I'm going to need to pause this like multiple times because there's so much to respond to here that it's just, it's mind blowing. <laughs> so with that being said, let's listen. How many of you, just raise your hand, are considering voting for Donald Trump? Uh... Four. And how many of you are considering voting for Joe Biden? For these 10 voters in Des Moines, Iowa, campaign season is already in full swing. Republican Frank Moran voted for Trump in 2016 and plans to again. The economy is booming where I, I just feel as though everything that I've been wanting to have done is being done. Heather, why do you? Okay, let's just stop right there. The economy is booming. So you hear all this news about the stock markets and um, simultaneously, Wages aren't increasing. Wages aren't increasing. Normal Americans aren't doing any better since Trump was elected. So to use the economy, that just tells me that this individual, he just, he doesn't read past the headlines. The economies have improved in a number of countries, in Europe and elsewhere. It's a global trend. So to credit Trump, I mean, here's the thing that people don't get, is that Presidents have not very much control over the economy. They can steer it to an extent. But with that being said, the economy isn't good because of Donald Trump. And when you look at the effect of Donald Trump's tax cuts, that helped rich people. It just gave rich people more money. So what are you talking about? Unless this guy is a billionaire or a millionaire, I don't get what he's talking about. But let's continue. Donald Trump. He's working on border control, which I think is really important this why is border control important how are you personally affected by immigration how has that affected you personally i mean for people who make immigration their number one issue i can't help but think you're just a useful idiot the ruling class is trying to distract you desperately from them rigging the economy and they're getting you to turn your attention to people who have no money and no power whatsoever. So congratulations, because you've been duped and you don't even get it. Like, immigration is so important. He's doing so much about immigration. I mean, come on. This is not a real issue. It's not a real issue. How do you not see that you've been played? And I just ripped out my ear, uh, earbud. <laughs> but let's continue. A lifelong independent voter is also supporting Trump. I vote for somebody who's going to protect and defend the Constitution. And protect and defend the Constitution. How incredibly ignorant is that? 
How incredibly ignorant is that? He's in violation of the emoluments clause. He's breaking the law. There were 10 instances of obstruction of justice in Mueller's report. You think this guy cares about the Constitution or law and order? There's a number of anti-BDS laws. Trump hasn't said anything about that. Trump gutted the Johnson Amendment, which allows religious organizations to engage in political activity. That is obviously a violation of the First Amendment, and it violates the principle of the separation of church and state. But because Trump says, I support the Constitution, this guy just says, oh, well, he says it, so that must suffice. You've got to go beyond the rhetoric and look at what he's doing. You have to look at what he's doing. He bombed Syria. Did he get Congress's approval for that the first time or the second time? He increased the drone wars by 432%. Did he get Congress's approval for that? Waging in war unilaterally without Congress's approval is an explicit violation of the Constitution. But I mean, Trump says, I love the Constitution. So they take him at his word. They take him at face value. And it's just, it's frustrating because these people are misinformed. So as an independent, you're not considering voting Republican at all? Oh, no, no. Of the Democrats and independents in this group, only one is already sold on Joe Biden, despite his front runner How? status. He can do a good job of bringing the country together. If we can move past rhetoric, and we can uh, bring someone who's more respected worldwide, I think we can have a better country from that. I what does that even mean? He can bring the country together. He was the vice president for eight years. Are we any more united? Were we any more united back then? I mean, you say you have to go past the rhetoric. So if you go past the rhetoric, you'll see that Joe Biden isn't about bringing anyone together. He's about essentially doing what right-wingers want. He's essentially a Republican. So I don't even know what that means. I've heard other voters in these types of panels say that too. Oh, you know, Joe Biden wants to bring people together. Why? Because he says he's going to bring people together. What does that even mean? Here's the thing. If you get in someone who is not Trump, but is very much responsible for creating the grim conditions that ultimately facilitated the rise of a demagogue like Donald Trump, I've got bad news for you. You're going to get another Trump in four to eight years who's probably going to be worse than Donald Trump. So when you say, and look, this is a young person, so I don't want to shit on this person. I'm just glad that he's participating in politics and voting. But when you say he wants to bring people together, really think deeply about that and ask yourself, what does that even mean? because he's not going to be as divisive as Donald Trump. There's other candidates. Every single candidate is not going to be as divisive as Donald Trump in the Democratic Party primary. None of them. Even the most corporate Democrat. Of course, they're not going to be as divisive. They'll be more polite. But ask yourself, what change with regard to policy will be different? And if you want to bring people together, wouldn't it make more sense to implement policies that are universal policies that are largely popular, like Medicare for all? raising the minimum wage. I just, I don't think these people thought very long and hard about their positions. Not as big a fan of Joe Biden. Uh, I would probably say I support uh, Pete Buttigieg. Ah, no. See, he gave me hope. He's like, okay, I'm not a fan of Joe Biden. And then he goes to Buttigieg. What about Buttigieg do you like? Name one policy that you think sets him apart from the rest of the field. What is he proposing? What's he running on? You don't know because he's not running on anything. It's all about platitudes, cliches, and just, I'm a wonk, vote for me, and then you'll get the policies later. Why? What's really bothered me about Joe Biden is the way that he has responded to the allegations by women. Some men in yeah, the group are turned sense. off by the same issue. I didn't like his, his idea that, okay, it's okay to just go up to a woman and smell her hair and say, I mean, who... Come on. Who that? Exactly. Okay. This is kind of a bright spot in this because I don't get how more people aren't bothered by this. Like it was a scandal for like a week and then it just was largely swept under the rug. But if you're a Democratic Party voter, I thought that you said you cared about misogyny. I thought that you said you were outraged at the way in which Donald Trump treats women and his misogyny. But for Joe Biden, he gets a pass? Really? I mean, to me, as someone who absolutely demands 
my personal space be respected. When I see these videos of Joe Biden whispering in the ears of women and little girls, it makes me cringe. It makes me fucking cringe. And he clearly hasn't learned his lesson because he was doing this again to a 10-year-old girl like last week. Am I saying that he's a pedophile or a sexual predator? No, but he doesn't know how to respect boundaries. He's incapable of it. And then he minimizes it and makes a joke out of it when, you know, um, he's called out. It's just, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. Republican voter Haley Ledford will be voting in her first presidential election and plans to support Trump for now. Would you ever consider not voting for Donald Trump given some of the things that he has said about women or his attitude towards women? Um, if there was a Republican candidate who represented my personal morals and beliefs, yeah, I would choose them over Donald Trump if they were a strong candidate. Okay, so what that tells me, she kind of just gave it away and revealed all of her cards here. Morals and beliefs. Whenever a Republican says that, that's code for, I am pro-life, quote unquote, pro-life, and I'm against LGBTQ rights and trans rights. I mean, I'm assuming, right? But mostly, if I had to guess, I'd say that abortion is her number one issue. Well, look, I'm glad that you probably self-describe as pro-life. So let me ask you this. I hope you're outraged at the fact that Donald Trump is giving Saudi Arabia the bombs that they're using to commit genocide in Yemen. They're dropping bombs on school buses in Yemen. So if you're pro-life, this is something that should concern you. You should be calling this out. You should be calling this out every single day at the top of your lungs. But a lot of pro-life people support Donald Trump. Turn a blind eye to all of the warmongering that he's doing. The very first raid that he greenlit when he became president in Yemen ended up resulting in the death of an American girl. An American girl. Nawar Alalaki. I don't ever hear any of these pro-life people speaking out against that. They're just one-dimensional, one-trick ponies who are duped by Republicans by this one-wedge issue. People realize they hired a, uh, a wealthy guy that's common to have a supermodel on his arm. That's his lifestyle. That's, in, that's actually irrelevant. It's about how they're going to defend our Constitution. Okay, I get that if you want to overlook Donald Trump's misogyny and just dumb fuckery in general because you think his policies are good, but then you pivot back to, oh, well, he wants to defend the Constitution. You haven't demonstrated sufficiently how he's defending the Constitution. How is he defending the Constitution? I'm assuming he'd say, oh, well, Second Amendment. Okay, that's one amendment. There's quite a bit of amendments. I mean, he's not defending the First Amendment. It just, ah, this is soul crushing. <laughs> I'm yelling, I'm sorry. Defend our borders and our sovereignty and tell us the truth, even if it's rough, laced with cuss words. We don't want the political correct message. We want the truth. We don't need the smoke blowing up our skirt. I, I don't know how you can possibly paint that broad of rush and just say not only are Republicans, but just Americans are pleased with who we have. As a woman, it is frustrating, depressing, and frightening to hear people just brush aside the misogynistic things that Donald Trump has done. She likes I'd Pete imagine. Buttigieg. Ah! Yeah, I think he's in See, I started to like her and then fucking... Hiring. He has a message that can um, restore the unity that we're looking for. I think as a veteran too, he would um, he would represent us well um, across the world. This day what? Uh, it's like, this is why this video is so soul crushing. Somebody will say something that you like and you'll be like, okay, a reasonable person. And they'll say, why well, like Pete Buttigieg? Why do you like Pete Buttigieg? What is it about him? Oh, he has a unifying message and he is a veteran so he can represent us around the world. Really? Because if you buy into that, you'd have to accept that other countries around the world are 100% okay with US imperialism. I don't know that, that they would agree with that. I just feel like him being a veteran is a non-issue. It's not a plus or a minus. It's just, it's irrelevant. It's not germane to your qualification as a presidential candidate. It makes no sense. Let's continue here and see what this lady says. Democratic voter likes Elizabeth Warren. She's smart. She gets things done. I also like the fact that she's not a middle-aged white guy. 
So she was kind of iffy about voting for Joe Biden at first. And then she says, well, I like Elizabeth Warren. She's smart. She gets things done. And she's not a middle-aged white guy. So you're voting like exclusively on the basis of identity. Don't you think that's a really privileged position to take? I mean, if you objectively believe that Elizabeth Warren is the better candidate, then fine. But to exclusively vote on the basis of identity, I mean, would you have supported John McCain back in 2008 over Barack Obama because he chose Sarah Palin as a running mate? Would you support Carly Fiorina over a Democrat because she's a woman? I mean, think about this. The difference between someone like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren is that he supports Medicare for all. She's running away from that. When you think about all of the healthcare disparities when it comes to trans rights, LGBTQ rights, women's healthcare disparities, to vote exclusively on the basis of identity, I mean, it makes sense that you want representation. I think we all want to increase representation because if women represent 50% of the population, then it only makes sense that 50% of Congress is occupied by women. That should reflect society. At the same time, substantive representation, doing what will benefit women is more important than just getting women in Congress. Descriptive representation versus substantive representation. They're both important, but at the end of the day, what matters is policy, not the identity. While many in this group have a long way to go in deciding, those supporting Trump are dug in. Heather, does um, it bother you that the president lies? I think a little, yeah. I mean, yes, it does. But, but that um, doesn't make you want to vote for it him. Doesn't, or it doesn't change my vote for him. And Randy joins me now. So, <laughs> so I'm going to stop that there. Um, this just hurt my fucking brain. Um, it just hurt my brain. I'm not surprised that the Trump supporters are, you know, they've already decided. But when it comes to Democratic Party vo voters, I mean, what are we doing, guys? What are we doing? Really take a step back and look at what led to Donald Trump. You had mass disenfranchisement with the establishment. People just feeling depressed and disenchanted with the political system. That catalyzed the rise of a demagogue who exploited their concerns. Don't you think that we should get someone who is the antithesis of Donald Trump, who can actually undo some of the things that facilitated the rise of Trump in the first place? Look, it's why the title of this video um, seems so, um, I don't want to say hyperbolic, but <laughs> it's soul crushing, right? Because it's like, you think that people get it. You think that people get it. We have a reality television star as our president. That is absolutely a sign that we need to step back and reevaluate what we've been doing. But apparently people aren't willing to do that. Okay. But um, if you opt for another corporate Democrat like Pete Buttigieg or Joe Biden, well, we just tested out how well a corporate Democrat fares against Donald Trump in 2016. If you, if you want to try that again, have at it. But don't complain then if we get another Supreme Court appointee by Donald Trump. That will be devastating. But I mean, we're kind of fucking ourselves over, guys, by continuously allowing these corporate Democrats to rise to the top of the crop when they should be ashamed and ostracized and marginalized in this primary. They should be getting zero pull whatsoever. Bernie Sanders spoke at George Washington University and he gave a speech about democratic socialism. Now, when I initially learned that he would be speaking about democratic socialism, I assumed that he'd be saying largely the same thing he said in the past. You know, I'm a democratic socialist in the sense that I believe we need a strong social safety net. We need to make sure that people have political and economic rights. But what we got here was much more than that. Certainly he touched on, touched on that. But what Bernie Sanders delivered here was by far the most comprehensive 
profound speech I think he's ever delivered. Like, this might literally be the best speech he's ever given. Because not only did he describe what he means by democratic socialism, but what he did is he talked about the way and really the history of socialism and how it's been used as a boogeyman to scare the masses and get them to not support policies that are in their best interests. And on top of that, he explained how his version of socialism is different than Donald Trump's version of socialism because Donald Trump supports socialism. He just supports corporate socialism. And what he did that I think was really important was he tied democratic socialism to combating the rise of fascism because during the Great Depression, what FDR did to fight extremism and fascism due to economic desperation was he impl implemented these policies that are social democratic. So what Bernie Sanders is saying is we're seeing this again right now. And if we truly want to stop fascism and curtail radicalization and desperation, we need to guarantee people a set of basic rights, a second bill of rights. So what this speech is about is him essentially laying out what FDR did to stop the rise of fascism and how it relates to now. And he's basically pledging to continue FDR's vision. Now, this speech is over 40 minutes long, and I can't possibly play all of it for you. And I will show you a clip, but with that being said, before I play a clip for you, I have a pretty long clip. It's like 10 minutes long, so you're watching a quarter of it. I would highly, highly encourage you to watch the entire speech. It's that good. I found it very difficult to kind of prepare a version that was more condensed, because what he's saying here, every word of it, is extremely important. So I'll link to the full speech down below. I would encourage you to watch that as opposed to the more condensed version, but I'm going to play a clip for you. 10 minutes long. If you've already seen it, you can fast forward past that. But when we come back, I'm going to talk about the implications here. Across the globe, the movement toward oligarchy runs parallel to the growth of authoritarian regimes like Putin in Russia, Xi in China, Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia, Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines, Herr Bolsonaro in Brazil, and Viktor Orban in Hungary, among others. These leaders meld corporatist, corporatist economics with xenophobia and authoritarianism. They redirect popular anger about inequality and declining economic conditions into violent rage against minorities whether they are immigrants, racial minorities, religious minorities, or the LGBT community. And to suppress the set, they are cracking down on democracy and human rights. In the United States, of course, we have our own version of this movement, which is being led by President Trump and many of his Republican allies who are attempting to divide our country up and attack these very same communities. Today, we are all rightly repulsed by the sight of neo-Nazis and Klansmen openly marching in Charlottesville, Virginia, and we are horrified by houses of worship being shot up by right-wing terrorists. But on February 20th, 1939, over 20,000 Nazis held a mass rally not in Berlin, not in Rome, but in Madison Square Garden, in front of a 30-foot banner of George Washington bordered with swastikas in New York City. New York City. But back then, those American extremists could not replicate the success of their authoritarian brethren across the ocean. Because we in the United States, thank God, made a different choice than Europe did in responding to the era's social and economic crises. We rejected the ideology of Mussolini and Hitler, and we instead embraced the bold and visionary leadership of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, then the leader of the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. Together, with organized labor, 
leaders in the African-American community and progressives inside and outside the Democratic Party, Roosevelt led a transformation of the American government and the American economy. Like today, the quest for transformative change was opposed by big business, by Wall Street, by the political establishment, by the Republican Party, and by the conservative wing of FDR's own Democratic Party. And he faced the same scare tactics then that we experience today. Red baiting, xenophobia, racism, and anti-Semitism. And Roosevelt concluded, and I quote, never before in all our history have these forces been so united against one candidate as they stand today. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. <laughs> President Roosevelt was reviled by the oligarchs of his time, who berated these extremely popular programs as socialism. Similarly, in the 1960s, when President Lyndon Johnson brought about Medicare, Medicaid, and other extremely popular and important programs, he was also viciously attacked by the ruling class of this country. And here is the point. It is no exaggeration to state that not only did FDR's agenda improve the lives of millions of Americans, but the New Deal was enormously popular politically and helped defeat far-right extremism. Today, we have a demagogue in the White House who, for cheap political gain, is attempting to deflect the attention of the American people away from the real crises that we face and instead is doing what demagogues always do, and that is to divide people up and legislate hatred. This is a president who supports brutal family separations, border walls, Muslim bans, anti-LGBT policies, deportations, and voter suppression. It is my very strong belief that the United States must reject that path of hatred and divisiveness and instead find the moral conviction to choose a different path, a higher path, a path of compassion, justice, and love. And that is the path that I call democratic socialism. Franklin Delano Roosevelt helped create a government that made transformative progress in protecting the needs of working families. Today, in the second decade of the 21st century, we must take up the unfinished business of the New Deal and carry it to completion. But now we must take the next step forward and guarantee every man, woman, and child in our country basic economic rights, the right to quality health care. The right to as much education as one needs to succeed in our society. The right to a good job that pays a living wage. The right to affordable housing. The right to a secure retirement. And the right to live in a clean environment. We must recognize that in the 21st century, in the wealthiest country in the history of the world, economic rights are human rights. 
And that is what I mean by democratic socialism. Truman said, and I quote, socialism is the epithet they have hurled at every advance the people have made in the last 20 years. And this is Truman. This is a quote from Harry Truman. Socialism is what they called social security. Socialism is what they called farm price supports. Socialism is what they called bank deposit insurance. Socialism is what they called the growth of free and independent labor organizations. Socialism is their name for almost anything that helps all of the people, end quote, Harry Truman. While President Trump and his fellow oligarchs attack us for our support of democratic socialism, they don't really oppose all forms of socialism. <laughs> they may hate democratic socialism because it benefits working people, but they absolutely love corporate socialism that enriches Trump and other billionaires. And that is the difference between Donald Trump and me. He believes in corporate socialism for the rich and powerful. I believe in a democratic socialism that works for the working families of this country. In 1944, FDR proposed an economic bill of rights, but he died a year later and was never able to fulfill that vision. Our job, 75 years later, is to complete what Roosevelt started. And that is why today I am proposing a 21st century economic bill of rights. My friends, these are my values. And that is why I call myself a democratic socialist. At its core is a deep and abiding faith in the American people to peacefully and democratically enact the transformative change that will create shared prosperity, social equality, and true freedom for all. Thank you very much. Everything he said there is crucial. It's absolutely crucial. When you have these times where large multinational corporations and oligarchs assume so much wealth and as a result, you know, subsequently power and influence due to their, their wealth, people get increasingly desperate and they often become radicalized. They end up getting exploited by a demagogue who preys on their desperation and who scapegoats women and minorities and immigrants. And that same thing that happened during the Great Depression in the United States and around Europe is happening again. So what FDR did was he gave us the blueprint. He gave us what we need to defeat fascism in order to stop fascism and stop the rise of these right-wing demagogues. You've got to cut off the source of what makes the popularity or the rise or potential rise of these demagogues possible in the first place. And that is mass disenchantment with the establishment, economic desperation. If you can stop that, then you can stop the rise of right-wing demagogues. And the ruling class, they don't care that fascism is on the rise. So Bernie Sanders also describes here, you didn't see this, but how, you know, there were numerous examples of this socialist boogeyman being invoked when Truman proposed a nationalized healthcare system. You know, those that drafted it were demonized as literal communist sympathizers who were following in the footsteps of Moscow. You know, when the Children's Health Insurance Program was proposed, it was called a step towards socialism by the Heritage Foundation. So you've got to understand they're trying to scare you. And they use socialism as a boogeyman to scare you. So what this speech demonstrated to me is Bernie Sanders is the only person running for president who gets this, who actually knows how to defeat fascism. 
Stop mass disenchantment with the establishment. Stop desperation. Give people a chance, the opportunity to be successful and move up and move up the economic ladder. And that's how you do it. That's how you do it. It's that simple, but nobody else gets it. Nobody else sees what FDR did and wants to continue his vision. Not even other progressives in the race, so-called progressives like Elizabeth Warren. Because look at this tweet from Edward Isaac Dovier. When I told Warren that Sanders is giving a speech today saying democratic socialism is the only way, she shook her head and laughed. When I asked Harris, she said, huh? When I asked Bennett, I don't think the American people know what that means. So, I mean, you expect someone like Kamala Harris to say that. You expect Michael Bennett to say that. But someone who purports to be a progressive, who claims that she's on our side, to laugh? This should make it very clear to everyone. It's Bernie. It's always been Bernie. Because let me remind you that during Donald Trump's State of the Union, when he declared that America will never be a socialist nation, Elizabeth Warren stood up and applauded him. She stood up and she applauded that fascist. It's always been Bernie. Regardless, if he wins or if he loses, we will all look back at this moment. Historians will see that Bernie Sanders was the one ticket out from the pain and economic anxiety that everyone is experiencing. Bernie Sanders was the one person who would serve as the antithesis to fascism and right-wing demagoguery. So, again, if you didn't take my advice and watch, you know, the full speech, do yourself the favor and watch the full speech. Bernie Sanders lays it all out as clear as day. He knows exactly what to do to get our country on track. What he does in America could reverberate around the world. Other countries could emulate his style of democratic socialism, even if it's not technically democratic socialism and it is more accurately described as, you know, social democracy. Still, Bernie Sanders is the one person who can actually get us on the right trajectory. So are you going to go with someone who's only progressive when it's politically expedient, like Elizabeth Warren? Are you going to go with someone who assumes that label only because they know that they need to win an election? Or are you going to go with someone who's telling you, clear as day, I want to be the next FDR. We saw what he did. I want to do that for you. Help me help you. The choice is clear. It's got to be Bernie. So one of my biggest gripes about corporate Democrats, besides their corporatism, of course, is that they're always so weak. They don't know how to one play politics and two, they don't know how to stand their ground against Republicans. I mean, the Republican Party is incredibly ruthless and they don't even care about the optics. They're always trying to do what they can to defeat Democrats. But when it comes to Democratic Party leadership, I mean, when you just juxtapose someone like Mitch McConnell to Chuck Schumer or Nancy Pelosi, the difference is night and day. I've always said that if we got a person just half as ruthless as Mitch McConnell in Democratic Party leadership, imagine what a difference that would make. Imagine how much stronger the left as a whole would be, but they're weak. And one of the issues that they have been incredibly weak on, namely Nancy Pelosi, is the issue of impeachment. There's a plethora of reasons that you have to open an impeachment inquiry. I mean, in the Mueller report, there are 10 different instances where Trump obstructed justice. He was in violation of the emoluments clause on day one. There's a number of reasons why Donald Trump is breaking the Constitution and should be impeached. But what is Nancy Pelosi doing? She's running scared, predictably. And AOC decided to call out this inherent weakness 
in the face of potential Republican opposition. So as Kate Sullivan and Manu Raju of CNN reports, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez said Tuesday, it appears Democrats are sitting on their hands when it comes to impeachment, reflecting the unease from an outspoken block of members who want Democrats to take a tougher stance against the president. When asked if she was satisfied with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's approach and opposition to beginning the impeachment process, Ocasio-Cortez told CNN, Personally, I am not. I think that an impeachment inquiry is right on our doorstep, the New York Democrat said, adding she is concerned about where the line to begin proceedings has been drawn. If now isn't the time, what is the bar? What is the line that we're waiting to be crossed for an impeachment inquiry? And so far, it doesn't seem like there is one, Ocasio-Cortez said. And so, without a clear boundary, it seems as though we're kind of sitting on our hands, she added. So if now isn't the time, then I think a lot of folks would like to know when is the time. Earlier Tuesday, Pelosi told CNN opening an impeachment inquiry is not off the table as she explained her continued opposition to formally opening the process. I don't think you should impeach for political reasons, and I don't think you should not impeach for political reasons, Pelosi said at the Peter G. Peterson Foundation's fiscal summit. Now, just stop for a moment and think about how tone deaf Nancy Pelosi's response is. Quote, I don't think you should impeach for political reasons, and I don't think you should not impeach for political reasons. Nancy, we're not talking about impeaching for political reasons. This isn't about politics. You have to disaggregate politics from the process of impeachment. We're talking about impeachment because Donald Trump broke the law. He's in violation of the Emoluments Clause right now. So you've got to make a decision here. Do you believe that we should hold wealthy and powerful people accountable or do you think we should live in a two-tier justice system where normal americans get prosecuted but the rich and the powerful get away scot-free when they brazenly break the law and violate the constitution that's the question it's about principle here not politics if you believe and all leftists should believe this that Every single individual, regardless of their status, should be held accountable when they break the law and violate the Constitution, then you can't not opt for impeachment here. You can't not. It's a matter of principle. And just broadening this out beyond Nancy Pelosi, think about how weak the aggregate Democratic Party is in the House of Representatives. So out of 235 Democrats in Congress, can you guess how many support impeachment? 60 just 60. I mean, how is this even a question? How is this even a question? Take a moment and flip this. Let's say Obama was in violation of the Emoluments Clause and he attempted to obstruct justice. If you look at the caucus of Republicans in the House, do you want to know the number that would be in favor of an impeachment inquiry into President Obama if the shoe was on the other foot? It would be 100%. It would be 100%. But Democrats are so weak that they're not even willing to open up an impeachment inquiry. And look, even if you're not convinced that you have enough to impeach Donald Trump with, that's fine. But opening this inquiry will lead to additional information. It's an inquiry, but Democrats are incapable of being strong. I mean, the Republican Party is as ruthless, perhaps, as they've ever been. They never think about how doing something or being overly obstructive when they're just going out of their way to obstruct for obstruction's sake will harm them. They tried to repeal Obamacare over 50 times. Mitch McConnell stole a Supreme Court nominee from Obama and then says that he's going to fill that seat in 2020, violating his own principle. At what point do Democrats start fighting fire with fire? How can you not be in favor of impeachment if you are a Democrat? How? It makes no sense. When are Democrats going to grow spines and start fighting Republicans? Do you understand that this is why Democrats lose and appear weak? It's because you don't fight on something that's easy. Someone who is in the White House right now that is in violation of the Constitution, they're too afraid to even open an impeachment inquiry. And I love that AOC called Nancy Pelosi out here because you can't beat around the bush here. You've got to say, no, I'm not satisfied with her. And here's the thing. AOC knows what she needs to do to get Nancy Pelosi to act because Nancy Pelosi does not like to appear weak, even if she is weak, even if she's not a true progressive. Because 
I want to show you her response here. So this is a quote from Nancy Pelosi. I don't want to see Trump impeached. I want to see him in prison. So do you understand what she's trying to do in order to not appear weak? She's trying to change the conversation. No, no, no. See, for me, this isn't just about impeachment. I want to see him in prison. Nancy, you are so transparent. We all know that that is nothing more than bluster. It's nothing more than bluster. Because if you believe that Donald Trump should be in prison, then shouldn't an impeachment inquiry reasonably fall within the range of what you support? And again, she said it's not off the table, but she's dragging her feet and people like AOC and Rashida Tlaib, they have to basically force Nancy Pelosi to even consider changing her mind. When you are the leader of the Democratic Party, you should be leading the cause, Nancy. What is wrong with you? So I don't get how this is debatable. I don't get why we have to put this much pressure on Democrats when, again, if roles were reversed, Republicans would have already started the impeachment proceedings against Barack Obama. They would have already started it. But this is what we have to deal with. Mealy-mouthed corporate Democrats who are too afraid to impeach and can't possibly fathom this being about more than just politics. They can't fathom that maybe this is about holding people in power accountable. Maybe this is about actually having a standard that is universally applicable. If we have one standard for poor people, then we should have the same standard for everyone else. Imagine if you obstructed justice, if you were being investigated, and it turns out you were innocent as a result of that investigation, but nonetheless, you still obstructed justice on 10 different occasions. You would have already been in jail. So are we going to give Donald Trump a pass because he's powerful and rich and is the president? I say, fuck no. Start the impeachment inquiry and impeach the motherfucker. This is not a difficult issue. This is not a difficult issue. Impeach the motherfucker. So if you're wondering why we haven't been hearing very much from Howard Schultz, who was floating the idea of running as a centrist independent, turns out he didn't actually take the hint that we all don't want anything to do with him. Turns out he stopped campaigning because of a medical issue, and he just announced that he's suspending his campaign for now. So as Amanda Turkle of HuffPost writes, Starbucks billionaire Howard Schultz told campaign staff that he is making significant cuts to his team as he suspends his political plans for the summer. Schultz came into the office Wednesday for the first time in months and met with the staff, according to a person in the room. He announced that he was letting everyone go except for those in senior leadership positions, adding he would not make a decision about running for president until after Labor Day. Shortly thereafter, Schultz sent an email to supporters saying that medical reasons had taken him out of commission for months, and he still needed time to recover. While I was in Arizona, I unfortunately experienced acute back pain that required me to cut my travels short, he wrote. Over the following two months, I underwent three separate back surgeries. Today, I am feeling much better and my doctors foresee a full recovery so long as I rest and rehabilitate. I have decided to take the summer to do just that. Schultz told his staff Wednesday that he was closely watching former Vice President Joe Biden, the frontrunner on the Democratic side, who is more moderate and centrist than many of the other candidates. Schultz said that if Biden does not appear to be the nominee, he would think about jumping into the presidential race after Super Tuesday. He is realigning a team for the next phase of his exploration, a Schultz aide said in response to a request for comment. So it seems like this medical issue has effectively forced him to suspend his campaign for now. And look, I don't wish harm on him. But with that being said, I really hope that he takes this time to really reflect on how privileged he is because he said that he had three back surgeries and I'm assuming that that cost a lot. Now, I want him to put himself in the position of a normal American. Imagine if you're an American and you don't have insurance. You would not be able to get the back surgeries needed to stop you from suffering. Howard Schultz is perfectly okay with that because 
not only does he not support Medicare for All, but he is vigorously opposed to it. And on top of that, as Ken Klippenstein points out, imagine being able to just take the summer off because your back hurts. Half of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. So they wouldn't even have the option of taking the summer off to recover. And even if you had a spouse that was working or you had some savings and you could potentially take that time to have unpaid leave with your job, you'd have to go through an approval process. You may potentially lose your job depending on the situation. Howard Schultz doesn't realize how privileged he is as a billionaire. And that's fine, right? You can be ignorant to that, but understand that if you're not fighting for us to have even just a fraction of the luxury that you have, the comfort that you have to have the surgeries that you need or take the time off that you need, then you've got to understand that you have no business representing the American people and you absolutely should not jump back in. Because he doesn't realize how privileged he sounds. Wouldn't it be nice to just take three months off if you needed it due to a medical issue? I mean, <laughs> so many people end up losing their jobs if this happens. Like my dad experienced back pain and he had his own business. And guess what happened? He lost everything. He didn't have the luxury to take time off. He lost his business. My family was living off of food banks. And this isn't just something that applies to my family. This is happening all over the country right now. But Howard Schultz, he's more concerned about his own ass. I already have the ability and the luxury and the privilege to just take three months off and get all the surgeries and medical procedures that I need. But for you, you don't deserve that. And I'm jumping in the race to make sure that we don't get a candidate who's going to give you a fraction of the privilege that I feel. I'm going to make sure I jump in to preserve the status quo and spoil the election so Trump continues to be president and I get to keep my tax cuts. How insufferably smug and privileged this prick is. You are a billionaire, Howard Schultz. You have no idea what normal Americans go through. How much does a banana cost? Could he even literally tell you how much a banana costs? I mean, it's one banana, Michael. What could it cost? $10? The fact that we have billionaires... The fact that 26 of the richest people have as much wealth as half of humanity, that's a problem. Every single billionaire is a policy failure. The mere existence of billionaires, which is someone with a massive wealth that they will never ever be able to spend in 10 lifetimes, let alone one. If that person can accumulate that much wealth, that is a system that has failed the people. That shows you how disgusting capitalism is. Capitalism is a virus, and it can't exist simultaneously with a healthy democracy. Because if you start getting that much wealth in a capitalist system, you end up subsequently accumulating power as a direct result of all that wealth. And then you end up subverting democracy in order to get what you want implemented. I mean, this isn't me saying that. This isn't speculation. This is backed up by studies. A Princeton University study published in 2014 just confirmed that average citizens' interests aren't being carried out when you look at policy outcomes. It's only the elite and business class. So Howard Schultz has no business running. And I had to talk about this because I'm never going to miss an opportunity to um, dunk on Howard Schultz because not only is he a greedy oligarch, but he's also just a dipshit. Like, I really believe that he's not very bright. And I'm not trying to go out of my way to lob this ad hominem attack at him. I genuinely believe he has a low IQ. And if you don't believe me, watch the scene in Town Hall. I did a segment about that. Um, and he really reveals that he knows nothing about politics. Maybe he knows about Starbucks and coffee and business, but... When it comes to politics, when it comes to crafting public policy, which you need to be well-versed in if you want to be president, you need to at least have a basic understanding of that. 
He knows nothing. And we already tested what would happen if we get a dipshit billionaire who doesn't know anything about policy into office. We have that right now. Not going too well, is it? Not going too well. And before all of the MAGA chuds comment saying, but Mike, the economy. Right. Presidents don't have much control over the economy. They can steer it to an extent, but economic recovery is what we're seeing around the world. It's a global trend currently. But go deeper than just what you hear in the headlines about the stock markets. Normal Americans are still living paycheck to paycheck. They can't afford a $500 emergency. That is not a sign of a healthy economy. That's a sign that capitalism is eating itself and killing our system and the planet as well. So Howard Schultz has no business being in politics. Stay the fuck out. Stick to coffee. Stay in your lane. We don't want you, Howard. Go away. Hello, everyone. I am here with a true progressive from the state of Texas. Her name is Sema Hernandez. She is currently running to be the Democratic Party nominee in 2020. You all know her from 2018 when she actually ran against Beto O'Rourke in the Democratic Party primary, and she actually got 23.7% of the vote. So she's surging. She's a strong progressive, perhaps the true progressive from Texas. And I have her on the show to talk about her 2020 campaign. Sema, thank you so much for joining the podcast. And thank you for inviting me. And it's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. It means a lot. And I've been really interested in your campaign because... Here's the thing. There's a lot of people that ran in 2018 that are now choosing to run again. And after seeing and hearing from all of you about how difficult it is to run for Congress and you ran for the Senate, my question is, what made you want to run again? Because, I mean, you have to be tired at this point. (laughs) Well, (laughs) yes, it it is exhausting, but I truly believe that the people of Texas and the people of this country and around the world are worth fighting for and running on a, a peace Uh, campaign on a platform that is unapologetically human and focusing on the issues that affect all of us, that's most important. And being a single mom of four kids, it's certainly not an easy task to do, but one that I'm willing to do because it's it's the moral obligation I'm choosing to take on for all the right reasons. Yeah, and that's absolutely commendable. Um, Can you talk about what your core issues are? Because the way that I always see it is if I were to run for Congress or get elected, I wouldn't know what to focus on because there's so many things that we have to fix. So what do you think would be like the three primary things that you would be fighting for in Congress? Environmental justice is one that we need to focus on extremely. I'm a fence line resident here in Pasadena, where it's a um, a condensed part of the petrochemical industry in the state of Texas. And so that's something that I would focus on along with uh, having a uh, a booming economy that is surrounding um or is, is created around uh, the Green New Deal and healthcare. And of course, you know, ending the war economy is something that's extremely important to, um, to this country and to the world because we are the biggest contributor to uh, greenhouse emissions that contribute to global warming. Yeah, and that's absolutely commendable because I like this because, you know, when people run for Congress, for the Senate, for the House, a lot of people assume, well, you know, that's not going to be my representative. So, you know, maybe I shouldn't donate if I live in Oregon, for example. But the great thing is that you're fighting for these things that as progressives, we all care very deeply about. And one thing that made me a little bit angry is that a lot of people kind of look at Beto O'Rourke and they say, oh, well, he's running for president. Why not just run for the Senate? But we already have someone running for the Senate who's actually a real progressive who supports Medicare for all. You're the real deal. So the problem, though, is after Beto O'Rourke initially kind of signaled support for your campaign, He then kind of flipped and signaled support for the corporate Democrat in the race. Talk a little bit about that, because one theme that we're seeing around the country as more and more progressives run is that anytime they start to pick up momentum, the establishment steps in and throws in their own corporate Democrat to try to stop the progressive from winning. Talk about that dynamic here, because it's absolutely something that's prevalent in this race. Yeah, well, in 2018, we saw that our campaign was was not really taken seriously, but you know, we fought really hard and we came in at 23 point whatever percent and we did it on $4,000 campaigning statewide. Wow. It was huge. And it was unheard of. It was remarkable. And it was literally groundbreaking what we did as the first time candidate ever running uh, as a Latina decolonized indigenous person supporting a very progressive platform. It was unheard of. So then we, we took that and we met with O'Rourke and, you know, we tried to figure out how we can work together but the one thing I wanted was Medicare for all for him to sign it while he was in Congress and he refused. So we went back and forth. And in that process, 
I joined the Poor People's Campaign, became the Texas co-chair for the Texas Poor People's Campaign, organized and uh, trained people for civil disobedience and did all that stuff. And then came back to the table with O'Rourke and he finally said, I'll support Medicare for all. And he said to me, well, what are you going to be doing? He said, I'm going to run against John Cornyn. I just reiterated it to him um, back in September Mm -hmm. after I gave him the endorsement after he said that he would support Medicare for all. And for the first time ever, his his uh, polling went up um, in, you know, since he started running for office against Ted Cruz. So we we realized that our endorsement carried a lot of weight, specifically in our marginalized communities, for them to come out and support him. Um, so when I saw that he supported my primary opponent, who was handpicked by Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi, it baffled me because the last thing that we need is more incrementalism, more war. We need a an actual health care plan that takes care of every single human being on, in this country. And um, I know that these other candidates that are running for office that are being propped up by corporate by the corporate establishment are not going to support these key pillars of our um, of our progressive platform. So yes, you know it's it's something that happens, and they're just you know playing uh, politics with our lives. And I'm as many people in the state of Texas and around this world, we're sick and tired of people playing with our lives like that, like we're expendable just for their own profit and their own gain. Yeah, that's the most frustrating thing, I think, because you see that there's this real urgency for a number of issues. I mean, people are dying 30 to 40,000 every single year due to a lack of health insurance. We have less than 12 years now to act when it comes to climate change, according to the IPCC. So this wheeling and dealing for endorsements and whatnot, it just people see it and it comes off as disingenuous. And you've always been the person who has spoken truth to power in Texas. And I'm really happy that you're running again, because I feel like if anyone is going to represent progressives, it's going to be you. It's not going to be Beto O'Rourke, because I think he's kind of shown his cards now and that he's not really too progressive and he's more career minded because he's running for president. I mean, you could be running for president right now, right? But you're choosing to fight and take on John Cornyn. Um, So I want to go back to what you said there, because you said you raised 4000, correct? Well, I raised a little bit over 4000, but I, I actually literally campaigned on $4,000. And you got 23.7%. I need of, people to just voters. Yes. I need people to realize what she accomplished. That's almost unfathomable. Like it seems like that's impossible, but she did it. So if you think that, you know, a progressive who doesn't take corporate PAC money is someone who, you know, isn't ever going to win. Is it difficult? Yes. But can she win? I think she kind of demonstrated that she has what it takes if she got a quarter of a million voters with 4,000. Like that's, that's mind blowing. It's absolutely mind blowing. So imagine if she were the nominee, what she could do. Absolutely. And the one thing that we we do want to reiterate as part of our campaign is in 2018, we didn't get any endorsements. Uh, what we did is we got volunteers that stepped up and did the unthinkable. Um, and they were not paid. They were volunteering because they believed in our campaign, our platform and our message. And that's one of the most important things is to connect with your voter on, on a personal level, because you're carrying their voice with you to the Senate or to Congress or to city council. And one of the things that our campaign did in 2018 that is doing in 2020 is we are working in coalition with other candidates across this country um, and locally across the state. So I am teaming up with as many people as possible because my mission is to flip the state of Texas blue and do it in a way that it's not just the seat I'm running for. It's congressional seats, city council, county commissioner's court. We're going to flip Texas all the way and uh, bring the progressive change that has been uh, literally in <laughs> waiting in, in the back for us to take charge. And I myself am, am really hopeful that something great is going to happen in 2020. And it doesn't necessarily have to do with our presidential election, which, you know, if Bernie won, it would be great. Um, but it's it starts at home. Yeah. And I want to reiterate that, that we, it starts at home in politics. All politics is local. And so we should be voting, um, not just in presidential races or midterm elections, but we should be voting for city and local elections as well. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree with that. Um, so let me put you on the spot a little bit. So I want to throw out some policies and I want to get a yes or no, or maybe on whether or not you support them. Um, and I think you are probably already decided on all of these. So this should be relatively easy. Medicare for all. Yes. Tuition free public colleges and universities. Yes. 
student loan debt cancellation. Absolutely, yes. Oh, I like that. Uh, Green New Deal. Yes. Ranked choice voting. Yes. Pardons for Chelsea Manning, Edward Snowden, reality winner, and Julian Assange. Hands down, yes. Oh, wait, actually, that's more of a presidential. But <laughs> if you support that, that's still good. Um, yeah. Let's see here. Uh, reparations for American descendants of slavery. Yes. Um, let's see. Public financing of all elections. Absolutely, yes. It would make it a hell of a lot easier for candidates like me to get elected as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, abolishing the Electoral College. Yes. Ending the filibuster. Ending the filibuster. Maybe. Or filibuster more. reform, like something in that sphere. Yeah, I definitely don't want to stand around listening to Ted Cruz. In- <laughs> Read that in the hat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm getting flashbacks to that now. Um, let's see here. A universal basic income that supplements our existing social safety net. Mm, can it be in conjunction? Um, yes, yes. So it would be on top of what we already offer. So it wouldn't replace it. It would be um, in addition to that. Okay, in addition, yes. Because I think replacing it is something that it's a Republican ploy to get rid of social safety net. Totally agree. You're, you're basically like in my mind now. Um, <laughs> okay, a federal jobs guarantee. Yes, uh, closing all of our military bases and ending U.S. imperialism. Ending U.S. imperialism, yes. Closing military bases, yes. Or transferring them in a different way, transforming them in a different way. Instead of using them to deploy missiles and, you know, set up bombs in the middle of the night in places like Yemen um, or Libya or Israel or, you know, <laughs> Palestine. I mean, that's, yeah. that's something that uh, is something I don't want to continue, but um, revitalizing our military to actually do what they're, what, what we want them to do to build a green new deal infrastructure, rebuild places that we've destroyed and um, help rebuild Puerto Rico. I mean, that's, yeah. that's a no brainer, Yeah, but definitely not for war. Yeah, absolutely. And you kind of went to the next one that I wanted to ask um, statehood for DC and Guam and a referendum for Puerto Rico so they can have self-determination. Absolutely. That's great. That's great. So I think that's pretty much all of the main things. The one last thing that I wanted to talk about was um, protecting pro BDS speech. You don't necessarily have to endorse PD- BDS per se, but so long as you'd stand up for people that do support it and you wouldn't enforce these pro BDS um, or these anti BDS pledges that we're seeing around the country. Would you? I would do both. That's great. See, okay. I already do both, so we're good. Okay, so um, I'm getting the sense that you're not afraid to like take politically um, almost volatile s- stances, which is great. <laughs> yeah, or on Venezuela. I mean, on Venezuela, it's to leave them the hell alone. They have elections and they did what they did, and there's no need for us to meddle specifically to gain control of the petrochemical industry there. Yeah. Now, let me ask you one thing that isn't policy related, but it's more related to politics. Let's say, hypothetically speaking, you're elected to Congress and we all know that there's going to be immense pressure from you. You're going to get attacked by Fox News every single day. You'll be the new target. You know, you'll you'll maybe take away some attention from AOC, um, but you're going to be forced to try to work with the Democratic Party that's going to silence you by offering you deals, offering to co-sponsor pieces of legislation if you don't do this and that or don't endorse how do you work with that? Like, how do you, how do you try to subvert that pressure and still remain true to your progressive principles? Well, if uh, 2018 was any indication of what I'm willing to walk away from, um, that that should be clear enough. It's I'm I'm willing to walk away from any kind of celebrity status because I'm not a celebrity. I'm running to be a public servant, and I don't want to be treated as a celebrity, or and I don't want to be a target and uh, try to try to, um, you know, have, have people like Fox, not people, but, uh, corporations like Fox news, try to throw me off my game because I have other things to focus on and capitulating to the democratic party is something that I'm not going to do, um, for any kind of political gain or any kind of money that they would throw my way. Um, I'm, I'm here and I'm running to be elected for the people and do what the people of Texas want me to do and listen to the constituents across the country and hear what's most important to them and act on it, not just sit and wait until an opportunity strikes that I can capitalize on politically. So I'm just going to do the work. Love it. That's a perfect answer. So I'm sure many people will be sold 
Tell us what we can do if we want to help you um, if we live in Texas and if we don't live in Texas and tell us where we can go to donate to you. Well, um, if you don't live in Texas, uh, what are you waiting for? Like, come on. <laughs> uh, let's let's I mean, the more people that move to Texas, the better chance that we can get to overturn certain laws in the state of Texas state legislature. Uh, but yes, definitely go to SEMA for Texas dot com or go to Act Blue and look me up at SEMA Hernandez or SEMA for Texas 2020. Um, donate whatever you can sign up to volunteer on our website. But yeah, SEMA for Texas dot com. That's where I'm at. OK, perfect. And. Are we able to phone bank for you if we live outside of Texas? Absolutely. Phone bank. Um, I don't know. Do uh, host an event. Uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, house party I'm, or something? House party. Yeah, I can yeah. definitely, you know, make my way. I traveled across Texas. I can travel across the country by car and video myself. I just will never use the live stream when I'm at a dental office or at a barbershop. <laughs> I like it. I like it a lot. And um, I think that you will keep people supporting you that way um, by not live streaming dental appointments or haircuts or whatever the case. May be. <laughs> yeah, no, I actually take pictures and I live stream at local coffee shops, uh, business, small business or family owned restaurants. And I, I want to to, you know, highlight the places in which I like to to hang out in. Yeah, and that's normal. Not water burger. Not that's, water burger. Yeah, that's that's a little bit more normal though to to do normal things like that. Um, that's what a lot of organizers do is go to restaurants, not necessarily the dentist's office. So um, <laughs> thank you for being normal in that regard. <laughs> so thank you so much. And let me just make a quick pitch for Sema. Um, she was able to accomplish a lot for four thousand dollars. Imagine what she could accomplish with ten thousand. Imagine what she could accomplish if she was able to raise a hundred thousand. So it's tough. Everybody is donating to presidential candidates currently and other candidates. But if you could just chip in and donate whatever you can, um, and if not money, maybe time, you could get someone like Sema in Congress to represent you. Imagine the influence that she would have over the Democratic Party, over the country. It'd be phenomenal. So chip in and um, help her out if you can. So Sema, thank you so much for coming on the program. All right. Thanks, Mike, for having me here. We'll talk soon. Yes, we will. Well, that's all that I've got for you guys today. Thank you so much for tuning in if you've made it this far. Thank you so much to my guest, Sema Hernandez. If you'd like more videos, you can go to humanistreport.com or if you want to support the show, you can check out patreon.com forward slash humanistreport. Thank you all so much. As usual, I want to thank you all for watching and listening. If you are catching this on iTunes or SoundCloud, you all help the show to not just survive, but thrive. Thank you. So, I'll see you all next week. Take care, everyone.